Hey there, I was at the Sundance Film Festival 2023 edition. No, not in person. I did not go to Utah. That's insane. It's way too expensive and it's really cold and I have a job. I got a digital film package where I was able to watch nine movies from the comfort of my own home. If somehow you've been living under a rock your entire life, the Sundance Film Festival is America's most prestigious film festival, also one of the most prestigious in the entire world. It was founded in the 19... by Robert Redford and continues to be a... Sh oh my god. <clears throat> and continues to be a showcase of both independent film and avant-garde studio filmmaking. Starting in COVID, they really expanded their horizons and started allowing people to stream films online. Although they're starting to shift their practices away from that a little bit, for example, this year, all of the most highly anticipated films were not available online, which I assume is an initiative to try to get more people to come to the festival in person because they generate a lot of revenue by doing that more so than people online. Because if you're online, you can't, you know, generate the local saw, uh, not saw, like, sorry, Park City economy. It makes sense, but it was still annoying to not be able to stream Eileen, Infinity Pool. Uh, oh, I wanted to see um, Polite Society. I couldn't watch that. Uh, I wanted to see the Nicole Holoff Center, uh, the, the You Hurt My Feelings. Uh, and I couldn't watch any of these movies. But I was able to watch nine films that I probably otherwise wouldn't have seen from all over the world. I'm going to be talking about them briefly. I don't want to give too much away because I don't like spoiling, but I wanted to give general thoughts and try to describe the movie in vague terms. So if it sounds appealing to you, you can go check it out. I don't believe in ascribing a numerical value to a piece of art, so I won't be rating them out of 10 or anything like that. But I will be talking about them in order of my preference. Uh, the one that I enjoyed the least I'll be talking about first, and the one I enjoyed the most I'll be talking about last. Although I genuinely don't feel that any of these movies were quote unquote bad, they definitely each have their core audience and even though I liked some rather than others, I would definitely recommend a certain type of person watch all of them. So please, if any of these films sound interesting to you, watch them. Seek them out. Support independent art. It really is important, I promise. I saw Run Rabbit Run, an Australian horror drama directed by Dana Reed. I was interested in watching this movie because it was in the midnight section. The midnight section of Sundance is reserved for the kind of crazier stuff, lots of genre movies like horror, um, you know, action, science fiction, just kind of like out there, weirder, weirder stuff, which is the stuff that I gravitate towards. I, I love all that shit. Uh, plus it stars Sarah Snook, who is one of my favorite up-and-coming actresses and not even really up-and-coming anymore she's kind of establishing herself she's on this show called Succession on HBO it's amazing she's fantastic overall this movie reminded me a lot of other movies like The Babadook uh, or maybe even Hereditary it's sort of in that elevated horror subgenre which is such a funny term to me because all that means, all you're saying is that it's a horror movie that has themes. It's as if most movies don't have themes. I don't know. It seems like a silly distinction to make. Uh, overall, though, I think the comparisons are apt, especially to The Babadook. This is operating mostly in the realm of metaphor. Uh, very little of consequence happens in terms of reality, uh, which isn't to say this is like a mind trip, headspace fuckery thing. It's it's mostly just you watch this movie and, you, and if you've seen horror movies before that came out in like the 2010s. If you've seen A24 horror movies, you're like, I think I know pretty much exactly where this is going. And that's not to say it's not well constructed. You know, it's it's shot well. Sarah Snook is is really fantastic. And, and the little kid's actually not bad either for a child actress and all the supporting cast. It's, it's fine. It's, it's a fine, it's a well-made movie. Uh, I just felt kind of bored because uh, I was able to predict pretty much everything that happened. I didn't feel unique. You know, when I first saw The Babadook, for instance, I was like, oh, this feels like really different. You know, I saw, you know, Hereditary. I was like, wow, this is something like pretty crazy and special and it just felt like you know this movie wasn't really doing enough to distinguish itself from other movies like it i also have this thing where it's like okay in movies where there's like a kid and the kid is doing creepy shit and the parent is like not addressing it or like doing anything like if i had a kid <laughs> which is very unlikely uh, but if i ever have a kid and it starts doing like weird creepy shit i would like go and I would talk to somebody. I would take the kid and be like, hey, something's wrong with my kid. I, and I don't, you know, it's a movie. It's fine. Um, and I could excuse a lot of this stuff if the movie was scary, but there aren't really any scary scenes. Uh, it didn't really feel tense. Like, there are some moments that are, like, disturbing just because of what's happening, but it's not, you know, the filmmaking isn't really disturbing. It's, it's, I don't know. I, I don't know how to describe it because I, I don't like being overly negative and the movie's fine. You know, it's, it's, it's a little over an hour and a half. It's like an hour and 40 minutes. You're not, you know, it's not a huge time commitment. Um, you know, there are some good performances. I think, you know, Dana Reed, you know, maybe with a more interesting or novel script could, could make a really great film. Um, but I, it's not bad. 
it's not bad and I'm being a little harsh but yeah it just I, I wasn't I wasn't impressed I saw The Eight Mountains co-directed by Felix Van Groeningen and Charlotte Vandermeersch. This is an Italian film that follows the life of two young boys as they become teenagers and then young men and then slightly older men, and their complex relationship as they start off as strangers and then become friends and then drift apart and then become really, really good friends again. The film is incredibly long, at about two and a half hours long. You get almost the full scope of these two men in their lives. A very detailed exploration into this relationship and the ideas of what male friendship even even is, we see these characters at many different places in their lives, and the actors do a fantastic job of showcasing the differences in their personalities relative to their circumstances, how people change and don't change over time, how they are influenced by other people and their environment, and how they are not influenced by people in their environment to change. Overall, the film has a lot going for it, both in terms of its production design and its thematic resonance. I personally found it to be incredibly slow moving, which meant I had a hard time staying invested. While the film is indeed beautiful to look at, there were one too many shots every scene or so that seemed to linger for the sake of it. I felt that the film would make its point and then it would continue on in the scene or the shot even though it had already effectively communicated what it was trying to say. Normally I don't think this is such a big deal, but at two and a half hours long I feel like a film has a responsibility to really earn that length. And here, I don't think that the two and a half hours was entirely justified. So felt that the story was paced kind of weird. The jumps in time were at once abrupt, but also very arbitrarily placed. I was always caught off guard whenever a time skip happened. It never felt natural. We would watch these characters live out their daily lives in kind of slow meandering ways and then a time jump would happen instantly and then a narration voiceover would explain what had happened in the interim, but the narration voiceover always sounded more interesting than what we were being shown. I was like, fuck, I want to watch a movie where that stuff happens, why am I watching this stuff instead? Although both of the lead actors do a commendable job, the lead character is really, really annoying, and I didn't agree with his behavior, especially when he was young. I don't think the film did enough to justify his actions by allowing us into his headspace until he was much older. In contrast, the other male lead's character was much more interesting, and although his actor did not do a bad job, it was still a more one-note consistent performance. Overall, I understand why this film is getting a lot of acclaim. It is definitely for a certain type of person, and if you are the type of person who enjoys these types of films, you will really love it. For me, I think that it has a lot going for it. I liked it, didn't love it, and I don't know if I'll watch it again, but I probably should to get a better sense of how I felt about it, because I was really tired when I watched it. Overall, I loved how beautiful it looked, but I was not engaged in the story. I don't really know if I would recommend it to most people, but if this sounds like something that is your thing, then check it out. I saw Sorcery, a Chilean film directed by Christopher Murray. This is sort of a revenge film that has very, very minor horror elements, but is mostly a drama. This film is about colonialism, specifically the German occupation of a specific island off the coast of Chile in the late 1800s. We follow a young girl as she attempts to right a wrong done against her family. I'm being specifically vague because I don't want to spoil it because I think it's worth checking out. Although I personally found the film to be a bit slow paced, the cinematography was absolutely beautiful and a lot of the performances were very compelling. The film is kind of vague in that it doesn't really give a lot away, but you're left to be able to interpret a lot of the actions and decisions of the characters for yourself. For instance, there are a group of characters who other people claim to be practicing witchcraft, and it's left up to you to decide whether or not they in fact are doing that. There is some very striking imagery and some truly haunting scenes. All of these are complemented by a truly fantastic score. The inciting incident of the film happens less than 10 minutes into the runtime. Honestly, my biggest complaint is I wish we had been given a little bit more time to get to know these characters and become acquainted with the setting before that. The event itself and everything that follows was super great, but I just wanted more setup. I think it would have given the entire film a bit more dramatic weight. That being said, there's lots to love here. You can tell that this is a labor of love and research and dedication to the craft on the part of the filmmakers. I'd say this is perfect for you if you're the type of person that likes a nice slow burn. This feels right at home in a sort of A24 catalog, and the main actress Valentina Veliz has a bright future of header for in the industry. 
I would definitely recommend this movie. I saw The Longest Goodbye, directed by Ido Mizrahi. This is a documentary film following a group of astronauts and other employees of NASA as they work to deal with the psychological and physical implications of long-term deep space travel. The subject matter was very interesting and the photography was very beautiful. This felt fairly standard for the modern documentary form in that there were a lot of talking heads interviews over beautiful footage. There really wasn't a dramatic question in the same sense that a lot of other narrative films or even other documentaries sort of pose things in a way that is meant to be interpretable. We're just shown a lot of first-hand or second-hand accounts of either astronauts who have been to space or have gone through training or their loved ones. And then there's data or anecdotal and physical evidence that suggests uh, isolation is harmful to the psyche and the body. Those implications and those findings can certainly be utilized in other areas aside from space travel. The first thing that came to my mind was maybe solitary confinement in prisons. Science was very useful and I found myself walking away from the sub 90 minute runtime mostly satisfied. There was an aspect of this film that I didn't really enjoy and that is when the astronauts would sort of read out their journals or poetry entries and uh, they sounded very stilted because they're not trained actors but the words themselves were very beautiful and poetic but it was this weird kind of like oh it feels like I'm watching like a middle school talent show <laughs> overall the fact that the film is so short means that I didn't feel like I wasted my time and I definitely enjoyed it there are moments where they talk about the technology getting to the point where they can have AI therapists on board to help maintain the sanity and mental health of the astronauts. I couldn't tell if the film was aware or not that this came across as a sort of dystopian nightmare, like NASA was creating a Black Mirror episode in real life, but either way, it was definitely interesting. Overall, if you like space and psychology and short documentaries, I think this was pretty well done and I would recommend it. I saw Animalia, directed by Sofia Aloui. This is a Moroccan film in a genre that I like to call soft science fiction. Nominally, it is about a group of people and their reaction to an alien invasion. I hesitate to even say invasion because the actual contact with the aliens is very minimal and it's really only referenced slightly outside of one or two key visual effects heavy scenes. This is clearly a low budget movie, and that's not a bad thing. The movie uses the science fiction elements as a backdrop to talk about the divides between the wealthy and the poor, men versus women, society's expectations based both on gender and privilege. It's basically Denis Villeneuve's arrival, but on a microscopic scale. I think that the fact the film visually looks incredibly stunning does it a lot of favors. Although the story is a little thin, the characters are very very rich and well-defined, especially the lead. We see her struggle with where she came from, where she is now. We get to see her struggle with the dissonance between the poverty she grew up with and the wealth she enjoys currently. This is one of those films that makes a lot of grand statements through suggestion. Not a lot concrete is actually explicitly said or shown, and the viewer is left to interpret a lot of the actions and behaviors of the characters for themselves. The movie is only 90 minutes long, which also does it a lot of favors. So I think if you are in the mood for a slow science fiction adjacent movie that heavily leans into contemporary political conversations, this is the movie for you. I also can't stress enough that it really truly does look very beautiful and showcases Moroccan landscapes and vistas that I haven't really seen in film very much before. Overall, I think this is definitely one to check out, provided you go in knowing it is somewhat of a slow experience. I saw Mamiwata, a Nigerian film directed by CJ Fiery Obasa. Yeah, that's his name. It's so fucking sick. This is a sort of African folklore film that takes place in a rural fishing village following a family of spiritual mediums. The film is pretty blatantly discussing colonialism and the implications of tradition versus modernity. There's a lot thematically to unpack, which is a shame because these gargantuan themes are kind of let down by the thin narrative. Don't get me wrong, there are definitely things happening on screen throughout the entire runtime, but the pace is pretty slow. This film is much more of a mood piece than a sort of standard narrative. That being said, the performances are all pretty great, the direction is very confident. I love the look of this film. It's got a very stark contrast, a very beautiful, gorgeous use of modern black and white photography. 
The costumes, the makeup, the general production design, it's all fantastic. This is one that I would recommend to the majority of people. There is some uncomfortable subject matter, but it's mostly fine and nothing incredibly graphic is shown on screen. If this manages to get a wider release, I can see it doing pretty well. It's definitely one of the most original films I've seen recently, so I commend it for that, if nothing else. I saw Heroic by David Zonana. This is a Mexican film about a group of young men who enroll in a police academy. If it hasn't already, the film is sure to draw a plethora of comparisons to Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. While the general themes are very similar, the two films in practice couldn't be more different. The film is shot incredibly well, which helps to not only tell the story in a compelling way, but also to showcase the unique environments. All of the acting is very believable. You can tell that the entire cast and crew was collaborating on a singular vision. There's a lot of choreographed movement, but it all feels very natural, which is not an easy thing to pull off. The atmosphere is very tense and oppressive. There's a lot of vague tension, and you're constantly kept on your toes, not knowing when something horrible is about to happen. It's kind of a tough watch. There are some truly awful things that happen to the characters, both off screen and on screen. I think that the director made the right choice in what he chose to show and not show in order to maximize the dramatic weight of the film. I am sure you're tired of hearing about films that are about quote unquote toxic masculinity, but this is one of the more original films to tackle that very contemporary subject matter. If you can handle some uncomfortable situations and depictions of violence on screen, then I would recommend this one as one of my more favorite films I saw at the festival this year. It also has a sub 90 minute runtime, so there's really no excuse to not check it out. I saw Bad Behavior, directed by Alice Englert. This is a New Zealand American co production. I was really shocked when I found out that the general reception to this movie has been pretty negative. I thought this is one of my favorite things I saw at the festival. It's a very black comedy, it is very, very, very strange. I'm not saying anything radical or new when I say that humor is incredibly subjective, but I was still pretty surprised at just how many people seem to really vehemently dislike this movie. It's sort of a weird structure. We follow both mother and daughter simultaneously as they each encounter a difficult situation in their lives. I don't really want to spoil anything, but all you kind of have to know is that these characters are meant to be a little unlikable. And by a little unlikable, I mean they're honestly pretty insufferable. The film is investigating mother-daughter relationships, and although I can't really comment as I am not a mother or a daughter, I still felt a universality to the theme of struggling to connect with someone even if you love them and care about them quite a bit. Like I said before, it's a black comedy with really, really strange humor, but I thought it was really funny. There are at least two scenes in here that are incredibly hilarious. Both Jennifer Connelly and Ben Wishaw are fantastic actors, and they give two of the best performances of their respective careers in this movie. I was captivated by them whenever they were on screen. I think a big reason this film is getting kind of shit on online is that director Alice Englert is a Nepo baby. The nepotism baby discourse has really been popping off the past three months or so. I don't want to assume I have to explain what a Nepo baby is to you. I don't think you're dumb, but I'll do so anyway, just in case. Basically, it is more common than not for children of famous people to enter the entertainment industry. Regardless of whether or not they have any talent, they tend to succeed and thrive and be given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity despite failing regularly. Well, of course, I think it's frustrating when people don't have any talent and are given opportunities that otherwise deserving people aren't given. I don't really think that's the case here. If this film is anything to go by, Alice Englert has a wicked sense of humor and a really solid grasp on the structure and language of film. The fact that she is the daughter of an Academy Award winning person, uh, director Jane Campion, gives the film a weird authenticity in a way. I'm only personally upset by Nepo babies getting work if they are one, untalented, and two, try to actively hide their connections. Like, I would totally understand if Englert was going around saying, No, being the daughter of a famous, renowned film director has not helped my career at all. I worked hard to get here. Completely on my own merits. <laughs> my background has not helped me at all. What are you talking about? Then I would agree and tell her to fuck off, but to my knowledge, she doesn't seem to be doing that. I personally think it's unrealistic to hold these famous children to a higher standard than the rest of us. I think gatekeeping them from being in the arts is silly. So let's just enjoy the work on its own terms. I think this movie was incredibly funny and I can't wait to see more from Alice Englert in the future. If this sounds like something you're interested, please check it out. Don't let people online tell you how to feel. Watch movies and decide for yourself if you like them or not. And finally, I saw Joyland, directed by Saim Sadiq. 
This is a Pakistani family drama film that follows several characters as they navigate their lives in contemporary Pakistan, struggling with the dissonance between their modern aspirations and traditional lifestyles. I honestly truly adored this movie. It is gorgeous both visually and thematically. All of the performance are incredibly powerful. The subject matter is very relevant to the world we live in today. It was perfectly paced in my opinion. Although the themes are sort of well-worn at this point, director Sadiq found new and innovative ways to explore them. I don't want to get too deep into a discussion about what literally happens in the movie because I don't want to spoil anything. If you only check out one film on this list, I would recommend you make it this one. Although it can be challenging and difficult to watch at times, it is pretty accessible. There is nothing in too graphic being shown, so you don't have to worry about a surprise gore or violent scene. It is a film about love in many different senses. The main thing I took away from the film was how sad it is that people are prevented from living the lives that they want to lead simply because they feel there's no way to go against the societal constraints against them. I know that a lot of people believe that you can separate politics from art, even though that's literally impossible to do because every single person has a point of view and when you're creating a piece of art, you have no choice but to put your point of view into the art you're making and all of our points of view are shaped by our environment, which is inherently political. But I truly do believe that this film is speaking to our moment in such a powerful way. There's an almost 0% chance that you will walk away from this movie without having felt something relevant to your life or the life of somebody you know. I honestly can't recommend this movie enough. Try not to learn anything about it going in. It's best, like all movies, going in blind. This one is absolutely getting a wide release sooner rather than later. It really is just that good. So please do me a favor and check it out whenever you can. Okay, I think that's everything. Thank you for listening. Uh, please do, if you do end up checking any of these out, uh, leave a comment. I would love to know what you think, even and especially if you disagree with me. Okay, keep staying tuned in for more 30 for 30 videos. I've got a lot more exciting things coming. I can't wait to share them with you. Okay, bye-bye.